World War Z spent $25 million to cut Brad Pitt fighting a zombie army in Russia. And that deleted scene ain't coming back to life. These films left buku bucks on the cutting room floor. With its crazy time travel plots, X-Men Days of Future Past is packed with familiar faces. But unfortunately, that means limited screen time for some of our favorite characters, including Anna Paquin's Rogue. A True Blood actress spent a week filming several elaborate scenes for the 2014 blockbuster, alongside original trilogy vets Ian McKellen, Patrick Stewart, and Sean Ashmore. But none of it wound up in the finished film. Director Brian Singer told Entertainment Weekly, through the editing process, the sequence became extraneous. Like many things in the editing process, it was an embarrassment of riches, and it was just one of the things that had to go. Paquin didn't sound too disappointed in an interview with Yahoo, saying, I got to hang out with my friends for five days in Montreal, see people I've known for two decades, and go play. Did it end up in the movie? No. Well, it was fun anyway. But after fan outcry, 20th Century Fox released a road cut of the film on DVD, restoring 17 minutes of previously cut footage that included Paquin's sequences. If all had gone as director Frank Oz and screenwriter Howard Ashman had initially planned, the 1986 adaptation of the Broadway musical Little Shop of Horrors wouldn't have ended quite as happily. In the theatrical ending, Seymour and Audrey live out their happily ever after, following a climax in which Seymour electrocutes Audrey too. Oh! However, the filmmakers intended to use the ending from the stage version of Little Shop of Horrors with Audrey 2 eating Audrey and Seymour and terrorizing the world. But test audiences hated it. Oz recalled to Entertainment Weekly, For every musical number, there was applause. They loved it. It was just fantastic. Until we killed our two leads, and then the theater became a refrigerator, an icebox. The elaborate 23-minute sequence, which cost a reported $5 million, was scrapped, and a new ending was shot with the two leads alive and well. Though a black-and-white version of the original ending was included on a 1998 DVD release, full-color footage was finally included in a Director's Cut Edition Blu-ray in 2012. If you watched World War Z and thought the ending seemed out of place, there's a good reason why. After the battle in Jerusalem, the movie ended on a jarring small-scale switch with Brad Pitt's Jerry wandering around a research laboratory to find a cure, and ultimately reuniting with his family. But the ending we got was the backup option for the original script, which finished things off in a far more epic fashion. In the original ending, Jerry and his sidekick Segan made it to Russia and joined the anti-zombie army. The story then skipped ahead to the winter, showing Jerry leading the Russian army into massive zombie battles. He contacted his wife Karen, who left him and wasn't in a relationship with one of the soldiers we saw at the beginning of the film, supposedly the soldier played by Matthew Fox. Not about to lose his family, Jerry embarked on a quest across Siberia, trying to reach the Pacific Ocean and find a way to his wife's camp in America. It's a downer ending that would have set up a whole trilogy of World War Z films. But this wasn't just a script idea. Most of the third act was actually filmed, but at the last minute, Paramount decided to go with a lighter, more hopeful ending. The reshoots ended up costing $25 million. That's a huge amount of money, especially since none of the original third act was used in the final cut. Frankly, the original version sounds awesome. We never knew we needed a bearded Brad Pitt leading the Russians into epic zombie battles until now. Dreamy, dim-witted Secretary Kevin isn't much help around the Ghostbusters office. He's more concerned with picking out his best audition headshots and flirting with the ladies and answering the phone. You know, an aquarium is a submarine for fish. But when he's possessed by Rowan during the film's climax, he uses his new powers to make hordes of army personnel and police officers do whatever he wants. If you think it feels like the perfect segue into a dance number, you'd be right. Director Paul Feig spent two days and somewhere in the vicinity of seven figures shooting an entire dance number, with Hemsworth and extras to the Bee Gees you should be dancing. But it was ultimately cut. Feig told Vulture, it was stopping the flow for the audience, because even though they really loved it, they were having trouble coming back out of it. It was making the rhythm a little too goofy, in a weird way. Rather than completely scrap the footage, Feig re-edited it and used it during the film's credits, so audiences would still get to see Hemsworth busting a move. The sequence was also restored for the extended cut on Blu-ray. Before DC decided to reboot the Superman franchise in 2013 with Zack Snyder at the helm, Brian Singer's 2006 entry starring Brandon Routh as a caped superhero flew into movie theaters with fairly mixed reviews. Superman Returns also nearly arrived with a completely different opening sequence. While the basic plot of the film deals with Superman's return to Earth after a five-year absence, Singer shot a wordless, visually stunning five-minute opening sequence, with Routh's Kal-El returning to Krypton. 
The scene, which cost an estimated $10 million, feels like something closer to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey than a slick superhero film. It's slow and contemplative rather than bombastic. And perhaps this is why producers ultimately had Singer cut it. The scene was finally released as an extra on the 2011 Superman anthology Blu-ray set, further dividing critics and fans on the one-off superhero flick. At the end of Doctor Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, the US dispatches a group of B-52s to drop H-bombs on the Soviet Union, but winds up abandoning the plan at the last minute. Unfortunately, one plane manages to drop its bombs, which triggers a nuclear chain reaction to the elegant strains of We'll Meet Again. However, director Stanley Kubrick envisioned a much different and messier ending to his 1964 satirical masterpiece. In an effort to show the complete absurdity of war, Kubrick filmed a giant pie fight between his principal cast and the war room in just one take, due to the mess and the expense of shooting. The scene kicks off with a pie hitting the president in the face, which, according to BFI, leads to the line, our beloved president has been infamously struck down by a pie in the prime of his life. However, the film's test screening happened on the day of John F. Kennedy's assassination, and suddenly the whole sequence felt problematic. Kubrick and the studio agreed that the pie fight didn't match the rest of the film's tone, and cut the scene for creative and political reasons. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here, this is the war room! Though it's unknown if the actual footage still exists, still photos of the scene are included in the DVD extras. The 1940s set mob movie Gangster Squad starring Sean Penn, Ryan Gosling, Josh Brolin, and Emma Stone once featured a key scene set at Gras Men's in Los Angeles. The sequence saw a pack of gangsters open fire on the audience, causing the theater to erupt in mayhem. The film was set to be released in early September of 2012, but tragedy struck. That July in Aurora, Colorado, a gunman opened fire on a theater full of moviegoers at a midnight screening of The Dark Knight Rises. Warner Brothers, the studio behind both The Dark Knight Rises and Gangster Squad, immediately pulled the latter's trailer from theaters and pushed back its release date in order to allow for extensive rewrites and reshoots. Released in early 2013, Gangster Squad featured an all-new ending, and director Ruben Fleischer had no problem with it, telling IndieWire during a press conference, We felt it necessary to reshoot that sequence, and I'm proud of the fact that we did. I think that we didn't compromise the film or our intent. And I think the newly shot Chinatown sequence is really well done, and that we should all respect the tragedy and not draw associations to our film." As most Back to the Future fans know, Eric Stoltz was originally cast as Marty McFly, the puffy, vest-wearing teenager sent back to 1955 in a souped-up DeLorean. Director Robert Zemeckis initially wanted to hire Michael J. Fox, but his Family Ties shooting schedule was too demanding at the time and hired Stoltz instead. Five weeks into filming, Zemeckis and Steven Spielberg knew they needed to replace Stoltz. In an excerpt from a book on the making of the film called We Don't Need Roads, the making of the Back to the Future trilogy, co-star Leah Thompson remarked, Eric had such an intensity, he saw drama in things. He wasn't really a comedian, and they needed a comedian. He's super funny in real life, but he didn't approach his work like that, and they really needed somebody who had those chops. Zemeckis and Spielberg quickly negotiated with Universal to replace Stoltz with Fox adding a reported $3 million to the film's budget and extra time onto its shooting schedule. Soon, Fox was on set at the Twin Pines Mall shooting with Christopher Lloyd, and the rest is history. When reporters are interviewing the gang at the end of The Goonies, Data says something kind of surprising for them and the audience. The octopus was very scary. Oh, no. Yeah, it was very dangerous. It turns out the gang really did have a close encounter of the eight-armed kind. In the original version of the 1985 cult classic, the Goonies careen down watery chutes and land in a lagoon, only to be attacked by a rubbery giant octopus. Just when you thought that wasn't ridiculous enough, Data stuffs his Walkman cassette player into its mouth, while blasting a pop track written for the film entitled Eight Arms to Hold You, and the octopus swims away. A lot of work went into the scene, which was fully edited and scored for inclusion in the film. Most likely, the fabled scene was cut for time, or deemed unnecessary and cheesy looking. When the Disney Channel acquired the TV rights to the film in the 90s, the network added the scene back in to make up for lost airtime, after deleting scenes deemed inappropriate for young children. While the scene is only included in the DVD extras, Data's non-sequitur revelation still remains in the final cut of the film. A curious group of movies were released in and around the 2000s that defy simple classification but all seem surprisingly similar. For lack of a succinct nickname, we'll call them modern fantasy horror adventures in blended medieval Victorian steampunk settings. 
That sounds convoluted, but it's explained best by its constituent movies, such as Red Riding Hood, Van Helsing, and Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters. All of them devoted considerable time and money to combining digital and practical effects, which made them all extra expensive. One film in this odd subgenre, 2005's The Brothers Grimm, wasted a lot of that expense on a single battle, which was cut from the movie entirely. The scene, which survives as a DVD extra, shows brothers Will and Jake Grimm trying to save Angelica from a massive tree that's magically come to life. It's apparent that many of the roots and branches were built as models, while the writhing branches were all digital, and the combination all but guarantees the scene a hefty price tag. Director Terry Gilliam confirmed as much to The Guardian, saying, I cut out the most expensive scene in the movie. It'll be on the DVD, the most expensive extra ever made. It's a great sequence, a fight in a tree. If you've seen The Amazing Spider-Man and its sequel, you know they revolve around Peter Parker and Gwen Stacy, played by Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone. The two films are notable for their decision to focus on the relationship between Parker and Stacy, replacing the Parker and Mary Jane relationship that was central in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy. What you may not know is that MJ was originally in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, appeared in multiple scenes, and was even played by well-known actress Shailene Woodley. Unfortunately for both Woodley and Mary Jane fans, her entire presence was cut from the film before release. Producer Matt Tolmack explained the decision to cut Woodley to the Los Angeles Times, saying, It felt like a distraction. You can't have Peter thinking about Gwen every moment, and then there's this girl next door who's suddenly there. We weren't ready for it. While the cost of cutting her from this film is unclear, Woodley's pay for other projects in the 2010s tended to hover for around the $200,000 to $250,000 mark per movie making it likely her deleted scenes cost quite a bit. And when you factor in Garfield's time, given his $500,000 payday for the first movie, it's likely that a lot of money was left on the cutting room floor. If you haven't seen The Raid or its sequel, The Raid 2, you're not alone. Despite both pictures receiving excellent reviews from critics and fans alike, neither became a commercial hit in the United States. As productions of the Indonesian film industry, the two movies have had a steadily increasing following on streaming services and DVD, but both remain relatively hidden cinematic gems. Nonetheless, the movies retain their small but dedicated following, thanks in large part to their consistently over-the-top action and violence both of which are on display in a large-scale deleted scene known as Gang War. The scene is available online, though a warning for those who haven't seen the films, it's exceptionally violent. Gang War was personally posted by the film's director, Gareth Evans, as part of the marketing for The Raid 2. And under the post, Evans gave his own colorful approximation of the sequence's cast. He wrote, This was probably the hardest for me to cut, due to the fact that the production on this scene lasted around six days of shooting, and it cost us a f load to make. As hard as it is to pin an exact amount to Gang War, Evan's description gives us a pretty good idea that it certainly wasn't cheap. Movies cost an arm and a leg to make. That's why production companies sometimes go looking for funds in the weirdest of places, which is where product placement comes in. Sometimes producers are desperate enough for that sweet, sweet product placement money that their film ends up becoming essentially one giant ad. Happily, Die Hard 2 avoided that fate. Tragically, it only did so because it ended up deleting its product placement, prompting a very costly lawsuit. In exchange for $20,000 from Black & Decker, Die Hard 2 producers agreed to feature a scene in which hero John McClane used one of the company's signature Univolt power drills. Understandably expecting the scene to make it to theaters, Black & Decker began marketing the drill with Die Hard tie-in ads. Not a cheap affair. When the scene was cut from the movie, Black & Decker sued distributor 20th Century Fox for $150,000, hoping to recoup its advertising costs. The thing is, Black & Decker's case was strong enough that 20th Century Fox agreed to settle out of court, likely causing them to rue the day they ever dared to cut a convenient, durable product at the Univolt. When Disney began developing Star Wars The Force Awakens, they knew that they had to get it right, which is why they threw tons of cash at it. According to filings obtained by Forbes, The Force Awakens was made with the largest budget of all time at over $533 million. With a budget like that, every single minute of deleted film was, by extension, ridiculously expensive. You might not know about its deleted scenes, as the Star Wars franchise doesn't tend to publicize its cut content in the way that other franchises do, but they are plentiful. Big-budget actors like Harrison Ford and Adam Driver have minutes of their work cut, entire practical effects sets complete with costumes and props are cut, and even scenes with finished digital effects are cut, like those featuring CG alien Mars Kanata. Oh my, this is a catastrophe. There are few movies as titanic as Avengers Endgame. Upon release, it snapped several box office records to dust. Highest grossing opening weekend, fastest film to reach $1 billion, numerous single-day records, and even for a while, highest grossing film of all time. 
Still, as the old saying goes, it takes money to make money. And Avengers Endgame is no exception. Costing an estimated $400 million, a big chunk of that paid for its unprecedentedly star-studded cast. Is that everyone? But you wanted more? And unfortunately for fans, many of that cast group scenes ended up on the cutting room floor. As the film's screenwriters told the New York Times, the climactic battle sequence was originally a whole lot longer, with, quote, its own three-act structure. One of the cut moments was a scene with a whopping 18 characters on set together in a trench. In fact, well over 10 minutes of filmed footage was cut, much of which featured the franchise's signature cast members. With the knowledge that Robert Downey Jr. earned $20 million up front for his role, Chris Evans, Chris Hemsworth, and Scarlett Johansson made $15 million each, and dozens of other big stars were getting millions for their time, we can safely conclude that every minute of the Avengers Endgame deleted scenes came with a hefty price tag. The Wicked Witch uses a lot of different tactics to try to stop Dorothy and her friends in The Wizard of Oz, but one never made it into the final version of the film. In the last Jitterbug sequence, Dorothy, the Scarecrow, Tin Man, and Cowardly Lion travel through the haunted woods, only to be attacked by evil bugs that cause them to break out in song and dance. I've set a little insect on ahead to take the fight out of them. <laughs> Also a popular dance style at the time, the Jitterbug was actually a remnant of an older version of the script that was tossed out. The whole number cost about $80,000 and took five weeks to shoot. But it was excised when producers deemed the film too long. Though the actual footage was apparently destroyed, composer Harold Allen captured a dress rehearsal of the number on home video, later included as an extra on the DVD version of the film. 